uh, this talk is a bit of an experiment. Um, so um, about two years ago, this is really way too loud, let me lower it. Uh, about two years ago, I was, uh, I had developed a course along with my uh, uh, colleague Brian von Strahlen um, uh, to try to get graduate students in the sciences and engineering um, who mostly came in knowing MATLAB and get them to a point where they actually uh, knew the, the tools of the trade for, that are kind of necessary for doing high performance computing except for parallelism. So this was kind of the prerequisite for being able to do the next course, which is taught by Jim Demel at Berkeley, uh, on uh, applied parallel computing. So you need to have a certain level of, of programming uh, mojo to be able to do that. So what I'm giving you today is kind of the uh, as a combination of the first lecture of the course and a summary of the course. And I'm going to try to do it in 60 minutes instead of 80, so, and then plus some scare slides at the end. You know, and I don't know how this is going to work out. Anyway, uh, so, and then on top of everything else, uh, you know, my, my eyesight's going. Uh, so, so uh, what are the elements of scientific simulation? Uh, we're mainly interested in, in scientific computing in this talk as it arises in simulation that requires either large software systems or high performance compute and high performance computing. Uh, increasingly, if you want high performance computing, you're, dealing, you're talking about large software systems for reasons that I will make, I will kind of uh, uh, slowly boil you frogs uh, over the next hour. Um, so uh, we want to, I want to remind you of, of the larger context. What are you doing this for anyway? Uh, you have a science or engineering problem that requires simulation. Uh, in order to do that, you have to have mo ma models that are mathematically well posed. Uh, computers do not understand any sort of reasoning they're, they're, uh, other than formal mathematical reasoning. They're formal mathematical objects. And, um, and if you have an unstable method, the computer will find the instability, let me assure you. Uh, so that's the kind of thing you have to worry about. Uh, discretizations, replacing continuous variables uh, by a finite number of discrete variables. Uh, software. You want software to be correct, you want it to be perform you, you want it to perform well. That's kind of where the, the center of mass of this talk is going to be. Uh, data, you have data, you have inputs, you have outputs, you want to make scientific discoveries, you want to do engineering design. Uh, hardware, I'm going to actually talk a little bit about that. And people, well, that's why you're all here. You're you're the people who are at least some subset of you who are going to be doing these things. So what are the tools of the trade for high performance computing? Um, what are the skills and tools that allow you to understand and perform good software design in particular? Uh, one of them is uh, programming, uh, uh, being able to express what you want, your intent in a, in a, in a concise way, in a, in a way that is maintainable. Uh, performance, uh, scalability, when I say scalability here, I'm not talking about parallel scalability. I'm talking about scalability to large software systems. Um, Perl scripts do not scale up to 100,000 lines. Uh, you need something with a little more structure. Uh, data structures and algorithms as they arise in scientific applications. Uh, tools for organizing large software development e effort. So this is the, the kind of, the last two are kind of the plumbing of, of our business. Uh, the build tools, source code control, debugging, data analysis tools. Data analysis is more than plumbing. But uh, the, 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 the things that you need to be able to do but are not necessarily the most intellectually exciting things. Uh, so the outline of the talk is a little bit about hardware. Uh, something, uh, so a discussion of the uh, seven motifs of scientific simulation. By the way, if you want to know what the original name for those motifs are, uh, go to Google, type in my full name, Philip Colella, and see what it completes with. And you will find out the original name for these things, which was declared to be politically incorrect by NSF. So we can't use it anymore. Uh, programming and software design. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, some about that. That is the whole, that's a one semester course. So I'm not going to, I'm going to give you a flavor of how we, uh, how we uh, discuss this. 
and a little bit about the plumbing. So actually, I have to, I have to make a choice here. Hmm. Uh, oh, that worked. Okay. Uh, I have to make a choice here, which is either talk about plumbing or talk about um, or, or or try to scare you at the end. All right. So, what is a, a kind of a modern uh, single uh, node uh, look like? So this is what is what's what do you what's on a chip anyway? Um, well, this is, there was an old picture we used to have up here, but this is the, the, the current picture, and even this one is a bit of a lie simply because, uh, you know, there, we, we didn't really want to have 24 of these cores. Uh, take six and pretend they're, they're multiplied by four. Uh, so what you have is a, a, a chip, a single a processor, if you like, but it has multiple cores. Uh, multiple, uh, it has multiple things that can do arithmetic, that can do logic, that can figure out um, instructions. Now, the important thing about uh, all of these things is that there is, um, is, is accessing memory. Uh, memory comes in lots of different flavors, uh, various, and the faster it is, the more expensive it is. And it's expensive in two different ways. It's expensive in terms of cost, and it's expensive in terms of power. So uh, what you really want is to have the illusion of the very fastest memory you can get while paying for the slowest memory you can get away with. Uh, and the way that has been done historically is by caches. So each core in a modern uh, processor has its core cache. Uh, it has a shared cache. Uh, these numbers are roughly uh, 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 correct. It has a memory controller that, that talks to the rest of the world. Often there is a second level cache. And then the thing that you think of as memory, the thing that, 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 that your, your laptop manufacturer advertises is how many uh, megabytes or gigabytes of memory you have, is this thing here. It's the DRAM. Uh, and then you have secondary and tertiary storage, uh, cloud. No, never mind. Don't talk, let's not even talk about that. Um, however, the important numbers are down here, latencies. So how long does it take to get the first byte? Well, the latency on, and you can, and, and if, in, in, if, if you're not comfortable with nanoseconds, think of it as the number of times, uh, the number of flops you can do in the length of time on a single core in the length of time it takes you to get that first byte. Well, the latencies on the caches, on the on-chip caches, are on the order of one. Now, uh, you get off of, uh, and uh, you get off of, uh, onto second level cache, the latencies are five to 10. You get over to main memory, the latencies are 100. Uh, and again, we're really, you know, talking about disk and tertiary storage, the latencies are 10 to the 7th. Now, on the other hand, the sizes kind of go into inversely proportionally. You have about 10 to the 6 bytes uh, on your second level cache. You have about 10 to the 6 bytes kind of overall, but it's being shared amongst 24 cores. And then the core caches are, are rather smaller. Uh, here you get to main memory. That's where you get to your, your gigabyte of memory. Uh, and as I said, as you get out farther and slower. So how does one maintain the illusion or the performance? It's not an illusion, it's, it's a fact. The performance of having fastest memory possible while paying for only something that's slower. And the answer is locality. Uh, you take advantage of the principle of locality. Uh, as I said, present as much memory as in the cheapest technology, uh, provide access to the speed offers by the fastest technology. So what's, how does locality work? Um, well, uh, the program access is really a severely, relatively small portion of, of the address space at any given time. And there are two different types of a locality. Local, temporal locality is that if an item is referenced, it will tend to be referenced again soon. Loops, reuse, things like that. Uh, so keep a copy of recently read memory in cache. Spatial locality. If an item is referenced, items that, uh, whose addresses are close by, who are stored near to it in memory, tend to be referenced soon. 
uh, straight line code, array access. So uh, guess where the next memory reference is going to be based on your access history. Um, processors at the present moment have relatively high lots of bandwidth to memory, but also high latency. Cache is the way that we hide latency. That is, we put the, we, um, uh, in both of these cases, we put things into those caches based on the things that have been accessed recently. Um, so, a uh, common way to exploit spatial locality is to assume stride one memory access. Cache fetches a cache line worth of memory on each cache myth. Uh, uh, cache line can be 32 to 512 bytes. So every time it fetches, fetches something from memory, you know, one byte, one word, whatever, it actually fetches a whole bunch. You know, 32 bytes, 512 bytes, uh, or more soon. Uh, each mat, cache myths, on the other hand, the bad news is every time you do a cache myth, you have to go to the next deeper access. Uh, and the processor will usually sit idle while this is happening. Um, so furthermore, stuff that you had in memory will get ejected because it needs to make space for the new stuff coming in. Um, so. Uh, that's, uh, and then if it turns out you really did need it after all, then it gets right back in, and this is called thrashing, and it it's really slows things down. Caches are designed to work best for programs where data access has lots of simple locality, and all this becomes more complicated as we have more processors on a chip, and even at 24 processors, it's, it's not easy. So this is the context. This is the, in some sense, the context of scientific computing for a long time now has been, it's all about the memory. It's all about memory access. To leading order, increasingly, flops are free. You only pay for memory access. Right now, to go from DRAM to, uh, to, to the processor is roughly 100 flops. Uh, when that number goes to 1,000 flops or 10,000 flops, then it's, um, that's, that's the scare slides at the end. I'll get to this. Um, so. So since we were talking about how important access to memory is, uh, let's talk about the algorithms that access memory. So simulation in the physical sciences is done using and various combinations of the following seven core algorithms. Uh, structured grids, unstructured grids, I'll go through these in more detail shortly, dense linear algebra, sparse linear algebra, FFTs, particles, Monte Carlo. Each of these has its own distinctive combination of computation and data access. And I emphasize combination of computation and data access because that's what's going to determine the performance, is your ability to manage that or the ability of uh, us to manage that, the, the community who does this business. Uh, I'm going to make a disclaimer at this point. I'm not going to talk about Monte Carlo because it's so different from everything else um, that it, uh, it's just, there's no way I can make, I, I could get through this in, in finite time. Um, so um, let's talk about structured grids first. So uh, these are things on rectangular grids. Um, and if these, if they, it is stored on a discrete rectangle, that is a rectangular a lattice of finite size, uh, then you store it in a contiguous chunk of memory. So you, you, you have a chunk and you want to index into it. Well, you just mar march through in, uh, in this order to, to get at it. So that these, since you have typical operations on, on this kind of structured grid or stencil operations, and their combination of unit access, uh, unit stride access, which is good for cache, and non-unit stride access, which goes by NX or, or in whatever the, the uh, uh, by, by an NX distance to get to the Y minus one or Y plus one or J minus one or J plus one index. And that's a non-unit access that's going to be less good for cache. Now, the, the bad news also here is that Typically, or, or traditionally, you have a small number of flops per memory access, uh, as well as a mixture of, of unit stride and non-unit stride. So these are the kinds of questions we want to ask of all of these algorithms. How is it laid out in memory? 
how much floating point work do you do per memory access and what kind of access do you make? Uh, just so that you don't think it's all that structured grids are easy, they're not because in practice uh, you often use uh, some sort of adaptive gridding in which case you have a bunch of blocks that are outlined here in this black wire frame, each of which is a rectangular patch, each of which has this nice regular access, but then you have this larger scale irregular access and the things that glue different levels together have irregular access. Unstructured grids. Uh, this is often used in uh, structural mechanics, finite element calculations. So you have a bunch of triangles uh, in this particular case in two dimensions and uh, each triangle is defined by three nodes and there's a logical relationship between, uh, 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 I'm sorry, between nodes and, and E elements. Each element, triangular element, is defined by three nodes and there's a, a logical relationship. Uh, discrete values of the function are uh, define actually a function on the entire triangle. So you have three values, that's enough to define, uniquely determine a linear function on that triangle. Um, so if you look at how, what the access patterns are re required to solve PDE problems using this kind of discretization, you find um, that the, uh, it's much more irregular than a structured grid. Uh, you have to, and it's important how you organize the triangles to make all this uh, not have uh, cash problems. So sorting, uh, graph traversal, things like that. Dense linear algebra. This is the one that we uh, all learned in, well, I guess now in grade school. Um, so you want to solve a, a, a system of equations. Uh, matrix times a vector is equal to another vector. You know B, you want the X's, and you know the A's. So how do you do that? Uh, this is Gaussian elimination. Um, you subtract off a multiple of this top row from all of the other rows here so that you, and so that you get a, another set, uh, a modified right-hand side and a modified uh, matrix, and you can keep doing this. Um, so this is called row reduction. Um, uh, LU decomposition is just a fancy way of writing row reduction. Um, this is um, good for performance. This, this, is, this is the thing you, in some ways, really like uh, because uh, you're doing unit stride. And in fact, um, you are doing, if you look kind of in aggregate, you're doing n cubed operations ultimately and n squared uh, memory accesses. So that sounds like you're doing order n flops per word of data access. But if you have to, if this is organized in a way where you have to write back to main memory, that, that can cause trouble. I'll show you a little bit more about that later as well. Um, sparse linear algebra, this is kind of the, 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 the linear system companion to, uh, to, to uh, unstructured grids. Uh, matrix multiplication of a matrix. This is a, this is a matrix, or at least the pattern of non-zeros of a matrix. Here's the diagonal. Uh, that actually is all filled in, and then you have a bunch of off-diagonal terms. Um, Gaussian elimination for this, so a, a direct method like Gaussian elimination for this is, is horrible because every time you do a row reduction, you fill in all the columns underneath non-zeros. So this, this thing fills in rather rapidly, and you lose any advantage to, to sparsity. So this is why one uses iterative methods typically with sparse matrices, which just a, a, a require you to apply the matrix to a vector. And that does preserve the sparsity pattern, but it's still, um, uh, there are still other problems with it, some mathematical, you have to have a good approximate inverse for this, but you also have to, um, it's still irregular. You still don't have, remember, Cache. cache, you need spatial locality, you need temporal locality. It's not obvious how to get those from this kind of uh, data pattern, even if all you're doing is matrix multiplication. Fast Fourier transform, that's uh, the next one. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the way that you, you really 
need to think about fast Fourier transform is you're, you're taking the dot product, you're doing an expansion of a, of a vector in terms of a very special basis. It is powers of uh, complex roots of unity. Um, and the thing that makes it special is that you can write this inner product as a sum of two inner products that look the same, but with half as many entries, plus where one of them is done is by z. So I've written this symbolically is the Fourier transform on endpoints evaluated at point i, is the Fourier transform on n over two points on the even points uh, of x, plus z times the Fourier transform on the odd points uh, of, the, of the n over two Fourier transform. And then we also have this, this, period, this periodicity condition, which allows you to get the rest of the coefficients, the ones that are not, uh, go, do not go from k to uh, k, k from uh, uh, zero to n over two. So the number of flops required to do, to compute f of n is 2n. It's this, this addition plus this multiplication, provided you have the n over 2 guys. And now to get the rest of it, you recurse, recurse, recurse. Uh, so if you can do that to n, you can do that to n over 2. And I've written it out explicitly here. Now, um, this leads to an interesting data access pattern. First of all, every level takes order to, it takes 2n flops, complex uh, multiplies, if n is a power of 2, for example. So this is the classic uh, uh, Kulituki algorithm from 1965. Um, so uh, the total number of flops you take is order n log n. However, the data access, and, and I wrote it recursively, but that's not the way you implement it. You can sort things so that you do something else. And the something else is written out here, but you have to know how to interpret this graph. This is the classic um, uh, tree graph. The way to interpret this graph is that, look at the bottom here. We take two points, so this is, this is with the, the, the inputs sorted appropriately. You take two values and produce two values. You take two more values, produce two more values. That pattern is repeated all the way up, and it's not, it's, it's not reflected in the colors. You have to know how to interpret the graph. So you say, OK, I have this value here, and it talks to this value here. I've got this value here. It talks to this value here. So these two values uh, end up being uh, replacing, uh, replace themselves with some computation that involves, that then provides those same two values, but something else happens. And it's done pairwise. And all the way up, you're doing pairs of operations until at the top you get everything. This is a very peculiar data pattern from the point of view of making it run fast on a cache-based architecture. Uh, particle methods, uh, collections of particles, they either represent real particles or a discretization of a continuous field. In either case, uh, you get ODEs that look kind of like this. Uh, you have Newton's second law of motion where you have a gravity, where you have a, some, uh, your force is given by a potential. Um, now, if you take this literally, to, to evaluate the force of a single particle requires n evaluations of the gradient, leading to an order n squared cost per time step, or per stage of a runge cutter method, first stage for an ODE solver. Um, this can be reduced to O of n log n for continuous fields, or to order n squared over p for discrete particles by various localization techniques. So the, the easiest one to understand is uh, if the potential here is something like Leonard Jones, which dies off like 1 over x to the sixth, you can just say, OK, outside of some, some distance, my particles don't interact. And that's a very good approximation. Now, to organize that in a systematic way, you have to sort the particles in some way so you know which ones are near and which ones are far. That's not hard to do. And it's, uh, it leads to uh, uh, particle, it leads to things like bin sorting. And you can even do this for long range forces. It's just a little harder. Uh, so things like Coulomb, uh, and that leads to particle, particle, particle mesh methods. So that's, those are the algorithms. And 
It isn't that we're going to do just one of them. It isn't as if these algorithms are the, the description I've given is sort of the algorithms you're actually going to use. You're going to use much more complicated versions of these. But they're still, at the end of the day, going to have to run well on these cache-based systems. So we have, and the third point is that you're going to be combining them in lots of different ways. So there's a whole class of, of people who are going to be doing, uh, amongst you in this room, who are going to be actually doing software design for large projects. So I want to simulate nuclear reactor. That's what Andrew's going to talk about. Uh, or I, I, I'm going to, I want to simulate lots of things. I'm, 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 a, I'm a mathematician, computationalist, uh, gun for hire. So I do everything from cosmology to cell biology um, with, with little help from real scientists. Uh, a lot of help from real scientists. So software design for large projects. Uh, there are a, a number of competing concerns. Uh, performance. You know, you, you want to get the most you can out of the machine. Um, expressiveness. This is a, a, a actually a, a, a term of art in computer science in, in, in programming language design. Uh, it, but from our point of view, it's how easy or difficult it is to express what you want the computer to do. Uh, maintainability. Um, this is a really unfortunate word because it is the correct word to use. But as our friend Chuck Romine uh, said, you tell this to a policy person, they think you're doing something with a bucket and a mop and, and therefore not having substantial content. But uh, it actually does have substantial content. The first thing of maintainability is debugging. You have to have a correct program. That's a maintenance issue. Uh, modification to do something different. Uh, scientists uh, and, and engineers, in fact, uh, don't as a general rule, solve the same problem over and over again. Uh, scientists in particular, they solve a problem. Great, I've made a scientific discovery. That's done, time to move on to the next one. But the problem with that is that when you move on to the next one, you want to add new models, you want to add new physics, you want to add new geometry. You're constantly changing your programs. Someone is constantly changing programs. Um, and this is of a piece with maintainability, the ability for other programmers on the team to pick up where you left off. Uh, and then finally, porting to new platforms. Uh, how, if, if every time you are confronted with a new machine with a somewhat different architecture, that you're gonna have to write everything from top to bottom, you're not gonna get very far in life. So you need to be able to deal with that problem as well, to insulate yourself from that problem. So what do we have at our disposal for him managing this issue? Um, so uh, this is kind of a, a reference to um, what I said about um, uh, students coming in to this course knowing only MATLAB. Uh, MATLAB is a wonderful language for doing rapid prototyping on small problems. But it does not scale to large software systems. And systems, and this bullet and the next bullet are kind of the reasons why. Uh, it does not, the, you want to have a system that has strong typing and compilation. So that is that you, you write a program, so if you've written programs in C, C++, things like that, uh, Fortran, uh, what you do is you write a program, you write a module even, just a, a, a subroutine, a piece of a program, and then you compile it you catch a large class of errors at compile time rather than runtime, particularly if the language is strongly typed. That is, every variable has to be completely defined in terms of what it, what it, what it is and what it does uh, and, what it can, and what it's allowed to do. So uh, you, you, you can't add an integer in a list, for example. But in order to detect that, that, is, that you can't do that at compile time, you have to have declared one variable to be an integer, the other variable to be a list. So that's what strong typing is all about. Uh, in the words of John Fodorero, strong typing is freedom. Um, he wrote his thesis in 1984. So, uh, 
large class, so uh, something that goes along with, with strong typing and, co uh, and compilation are strong scoping rules. Uh, probably the thing that, that drives me the craziest when I, I have to teach some courses with MATLAB is the fact that it has flat scope. Everyone knows everyone else. You, all of your variables are there. You have to be careful not to reuse variable names that you've already used. There, it's it's hard to, it's it, it's hard to even write programs with with flat scope uh, that are of any large size. But it's also hard to do other things you'd like to do that make programs more maintainable. Uh, abstraction and orthogonalization. Um, so what does this mean? Um, all right, you, when you're describing an algorithm, uh, or at least when I'm describing an algorithm, uh, I, I tend to come up with some sort of mathematical notation, write it down, um, LaTeX it up, whatever, and with an appropriate definition of that notation, I can describe it in a fairly concise fashion. Uh, and furthermore, it com it, with that notation defined, it communicates well to colleagues who are looking at the algorithm. Um, so, um, so abstraction is a powerful tool. Orthogonalization is, um, again, uh, trying to uh, separate concerns. I'll, 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 I'm not sure how, much, how far I'll get in that, but uh, we'll see. Um, and the use of libraries and layered design. So all of these things that kind of uh, abstract things away so that below some level you don't have to worry about it. Um, this is actually something that's a difficult to sell in the scientific community. Um, and I, I just had a discussion with uh, Salman Habib uh, a few days ago, uh, who's a very good uh, computational cosmologist, and he says, well, he doesn't want to lose the skills of being able, and we were discussing, why, why can't we make Poisson solvers, Laplace and phi equal rho? be like frozen pork bellies, a commodity. Uh, and, and he says he doesn't want to lose that skill. And I said, Salman, when was the last time you wrote your own sine and cosine function? At some point, you would like to say, below that level, I'm going to trust the people who write, this, who write software for a living. And in fact, you would like to raise the semantic level where that happens so that you can worry about the harder problems, the problems where we don't quite know what to do. And that's what libraries are good for, and that's what layered design is good for. Now, where do you go to find these kinds of, the, the right programming environments for this? So C++, Java, some dialects of Fortran support these techniques to various degrees well. Uh, the, the trick in this is, is to do this without sacrificing performance on the motifs that I've given above here. Uh, in the discussion, I'm going to focus on C++ because that's what we teach the course in. Um, what, what are the properties that we have that we like about C++? It's a strongly typed language with a mature type compiler technology. Um, and it also has very powerful abstraction mechanisms, and you'll see some examples of that. So uh, just dive right in. So what, what, what is, from the point of view of, of the kinds of things I'm talking about, what are the important issues here? Um, well, what, what do you basically have? What do you have to start with? Uh, you have built-in types. You have floats. You have doubles. You have characters. You have uh, strings. Uh, this doesn't seem like a whole lot. I mean, this is, this is what you get from C. And in fact, it's not even as good as MATLAB. MATLAB at least has a matrix and a vector class. Uh, you can add some elements and make a big difference. You arrays, pointers, functions, looping, conditionals. Things, again, that should be familiar to you uh, if certainly if you've programmed in C or C++, uh, but also if you've programmed in MATLAB, you use all of these. You use many of these things. Pointer, not so much. Um, so you can write very advanced, just with this set of constructions, you can write very advanced programs. Your operating system, for example. Um, but you're not going to be changing your operating system, and in fact, operating systems tend to be relatively stable. Um, in fact, I, I'm going to use this as, uh, again, another, another anecdote. Uh, the plural of anecdote is, uh, is not data, but sometimes anecdotes are illuminating. Um, so uh, one time a, computer, a, a real computer scientist, someone who'd worked in, in kind of uh, industry at VMware uh, and places like that, uh, had, had done at one point a stint doing scientific computing. 
And he made a very interesting comment. He said that in scientific computing, the size of your code is not that big by industry standards. Half a million, million lines for a big library. The problem with it is, is that the semantic content of each line is so much greater. There is so much more context, mathematical, algorithmic, that managing a half million lines of code in our universe is as hard or harder a problem as managing something that's an order of magnitude larger in the universe of commercial computing. So, um, so we're doing scientific computing here. So where are matrix and vector? Well, um, we, uh, we build them. And one of the nice things about C++ is it gives us a nice way of building your own types. Um, you can build 3D arrays, tensors, uh, things that support the other motifs. C++ lets you build user-defined types. These are called classes. Classes are actually, they're more than user-defined types because types implicitly have associated with them, although maybe you don't think about them as separate things, uh, there are types and there are operations. Uh, so integers have associated with them arithmetic. Same with floats. C++ lets you make that binding, that they don't have to be functions, they can be things that are bound to the class. You can make an array type, a tensor type that has contraction associated with it. So this is a very powerful uh, uh, a mechanism for essentially building custom languages. Uh, classes also provide a mechanism for controlling scope. You know, who gets to see what? Uh, there's private data, which are internal representations of the objects that users don't need. So uh, something that is a variable of a, this type is referred to as an object. So the private data and functions are internal things that uh, the users don't need to know about, and they may change. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice it except the performance would get better, presumably. Some ask, we, we wouldn't change it to make it worse. Um, public data functions. These are the functions and operations that manipulate the state of this class and present the, what the user needs from the class. And then there's a, something in between which is protected, which is intermediate between the first two, but is closer to private than public. So you can wall off the internal representation of things and possibly change it if you need to without the user of the class knowing about it. Um, this is a form of layering. Now, there's one other very powerful thing that um, you have in C++, which is uh, templates. And it's, it's, it's mainly used to avoid uh, cut and paste coding. How many times have you said, well, OK, I, I've, I've got this, this particular piece of functionality, and I need a different version of it, so I'm going to just take it, uh, copy it over into another file, and modify it slightly as required. Um, so uh, this is a terrible practice. It leads to more trouble than you can imagine. Uh, you usually, you find bugs, you know, long after you've cut and pasted the same bug in several source files. Uh, the once uniform interfaces, the things that you started out as having a nice design, they start to diverge. And if you're a library developer, the users become frustrated. If you're a user of your own work, you become frustrated. Um, uh, my colleague Brian wrote this slide, so don't blame me for the awesome. Uh, awesome new functions do, don't get added to all the versions of your class. Um, and um, you end up with a lot of code. You have to maintain, document, and test. So how do templates work? Rather than try to explain them in, an ab in the abstraction, I'm going to show you a little example. So we want vectors. Um, so here is a class vector. And the way to think of a vector is this is a way of defining vectors of anything of class read as type T. So it can be 
vectors of ints, it can be vectors of, of floats, it can be vectors of vectors of ints, et cetera. Um, and what you, you can define both the interface, which is what I'm doing here, what are the functions defined on this, and, um, and actually what these functions do without really knowing what exactly T is. So what is the interface to a vector? Well, um, it's uh, defining something to be of, some, it's how do you define it? Uh, how do you uh, copy it? Um, you, define scale, you define scalar multiplication on it. Um, if, and it, this assumes that star is defined on T. Uh, you can define uh, an inner product on it. Uh, you can index into it. So that's what this does. Uh, you can add two of them together. And then this final one, which is important, the kinds of vectors we're talking about here, are ones that you can resize. You can add another element to the end. Or you can, there's, you can actually take another element off. So these are the interface that, the, that gets presented to the user. Notice that when you add, actually, you'll see in a minute how the syntax works when you actually want one of these for a specific T. Now, Internally, it's represented as a pointer to, uh, to t and an integer which gives the size. But you don't, know, you don't know that. All you see is this interface. So how will we use this? We'll do this by, to show how you would represent sparse uh, linear algebra, sparse matrix spectrum multiplication. So we have a matrix here. We only want to store non-zeros, so we use a compressed storage format. We represent this matrix in, internally as a pair of vector of vectors. So for each row, we'll have, so we'll have two vectors. One of them is what's the column index of, of the non-zeros in this row? So that'll be some That'll be a vector of length one in the first row, a vector of length two in the second row, et cetera. The second vector is going to be what are the actual values? So I've, I've, I've written this out here. So I have internally the VI of one is going to be, uh, this is actually wrong. This should be uh, two and four, not two and three. Um, and uh, VR of 1 is going to be 2.3 and 1.4. Uh, everything is zero based in C, so we're, we're adhering to that and defining our vectors. Our vectors start at zero. So that's how we want to represent a vector is as a vector of vectors of floats uh, combined with a vector of vectors of ints. Ooh, that was... So uh, how do we actually program this? So here's a sparse matrix class. So we have a constructor, something that says, here's, how, here's, how you do, here's the function that you call to define it. Uh, we have a matrix vector multiply. Um, we have a uh, multiplication by a scalar. And we have... Um, the ability to index into the, uh, into the uh, matrix by passing it a pair of integers. That's this guy here. So well, how is it represented internally? So here's the syntax for using templated classes. Vector is a templated class. So here is a vector of vectors of floats. At compile time, the compiler knows what this means because it knows that the vector is a templated class, so it will go and replace in this vector the float type, which it knows, and then it will replace in this vector, now that it knows vector of floats, it'll replace vector of floats for this type, and the compiler knows everything it needs to know to compile this into code. Similarly for vector of vector events. So as you can see here, the ability to have vectors of anything is very powerful 
and can be used in lots of unexpected ways. Furthermore, it's expressive. It's unambiguous what this means. In fact, I claim that this is easier to read than the slide I wrote out previously. I, can, I know what this says, uh, partially because I was using courier font, so, so it's easier to read courier because uh, you don't have problems. So, and then when you use a sparse matrix uh, object, you define a sparse matrix, and then you can uh, essentially define the, the sparse matrix that's the, uh, uh, the second difference operator, and then you can do matrix multiply. So, all of these things are uh, pretty straightforward. Now, um, for some of the other motifs, uh, I think there's a question you need to ask. So uh, this is the buyer build question. So buy is uh, use software developed and maintained by someone else. Build is to write your own. There are some problems that are sufficiently well characterized that there are bulletproof software packages freely, freely available. available. Um, LAPAC for dense linear algebra, FFTW, and actually other FFT packages for fast Fourier transform. You still need to understand their properties and how to integrate them into your application. Now, build, that's writing it yourself. Uh, what do you use as a starting point? Um, one of my colleagues, uh, who is a, a very good CFDer, um, has, has said that, that the, the way that we do business has to change because it has now gotten to the point where the length of time it takes to start from a clean sheet of paper to, write a, to writing a state-of-the-art CFD code exceeds the lifetime of a graduate student. So um, that's no longer a viable model. You have to work in teams. You have to work, uh, build on prior work. All of those things are, uh, say that the build option is one that needs to be planned carefully, and you need to decide how much you're going to leverage off of other work. Now, uh, as someone who puts out other kinds of work, so a framework, um, unlike LAPAC and FFTW, frameworks are typically not black boxes. Uh, you, t you will need to interact more deeply with them because you'll end up, they'll, they'll, they will, you know, AX equal B is well, is well characterized. FFT is well characterized. Uh, solving a PDE on an adaptive grid is not well characterized. Um, so uh, you're going to end up having to interact more strongly with them and customize them and uh, probably send haranguing emails to the developers. Now, here's a graph that illustrates why sometimes you know, you want to resist the temptation to build everything yourself. This is matrix multiply uh, uh, done several ways. So this is, this is an old graph as indicated by the fact that the, the, it was done on a sun ultra 1 slash 170 with a peak uh, floating point with a, a, a peak performance of 330 megaflops. But it illustrates the point. So down here is doing um, matrix multiply using the standard uh, triply nested loop. And it's interesting, there are two interesting facts about this. Is one is that there are other things up here that work much better. But the second thing is that even here, there's a, 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 a drop off. So you start out here, you know, between 50 and 100 mega flops until the matrix gets out to about uh, uh, 256 squared, and then you fall off the edge of a cliff and you're down around 10, 10 megaflops. You've, so the way that you interpret this is you've blown out of cash. Uh, you're now spilling or thrashing or doing something bad. This, there are, there, there are not enough of this calculation, this triply nested loop calculation fits into cash that you get sufficient reuse so that you're not constantly reading things in from memory. Now, up here, you get, have matrix multiply optimized several ways. There is a, 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 an automated tool, FIPAC, that essentially just does a parameter scan, tries matrix multiply, the parameters of organizing matrix multiply by blocking, and for this particular machine, finds the best one. Uh, and that was developed by, uh, 
uh, Jim Demmel and Jack Nongera had another package that uh, did a similar thing called Atlas. But as you can see, two important things, and then there's this Sun, you know, hand-coded uh, thing. As you can see, there are two properties of these things that are very desirable. One of them is that you get much higher performance. You're up here in the 200 to 300 megaflop range instead of down here below 100 or below around 10. And the other is that it's uniform with respect to the size of the matrix. So small matrix, big matrix. It's doing something tricky and clever to organize the calculation so that your data is, is spending, your, your computation is not writing out to memory nearly as often. And remember, so, so on this machine, uh, 220 megaflops is, is two-thirds of peak, and it's, that's not easy to come by. Okay, plumbing. I think, uh, so how am I doing on time here? I have what? Ten minutes. Okay, so I think I'll do the scare slides, um, and I'll save the plumbing. I, I, I'll have a little plumbing demo during the afternoon, uh, if anyone wants to see it. Um, so plumbing. Uh, build systems. Um, so the first time you do, uh, so if, again, uh, the, the, I'll use MATLAB as, 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 as the, uh, the thing I beat up on. You know, you do MATLAB, you sit, you sit down at the keyboard, you start typing in commands, and you start seeing stuff come out. If, you, if that gets tedious to debug, you write scripts that then you, you invoke from MATLAB and stuff comes out. Um, when you're working with compiled systems or even large systems, it's a good idea to use build systems, either make or gmake or config, something like that. And even for not very big problems, I do um, a lot of prototyping in, in Fortran. It's a fast prototyping language for me. Um, uh, so, but even for Fortran programs of a you know, on the order of a thousand lines. I will use make. Why? Because I want to be able to organize in a systematic way, being able to build up tests of subcomponents and to be able to invoke the compiler rapidly. Um, and um, make is really good for that. And as I said in the demo, I can show you that. Revision control. Uh, when I teach, when I taught this course last time and when I teach it again, uh, the everyone, all the students work off of software repositories that we set up. Uh, they're, they're done under SVN. They each have access to only to their own repository. I, as the instructor and the TAs, if I get them, uh, have access to uh, the, all of the repositories. So um, there are two points in which they start to get it. The first point is when they come in, they say, I have a problem. I don't understand how my, why my program is doing X. I said, check it back into your repository. They're sitting next to me. I check it out because I can check out all of them. And I build it in my own environment. And it, you know, it's fast for me to find problems. I've been at this for a while. But they kind of get it then. But the place where they really get it is when they're doing the final projects. The way final projects work uh, in, in this, pro in this uh, program is students self-organize into three students' teams and do something together. Now, if you have a source uh, rep a repository, what it does is it directs traffic. People are checking stuff in and out. They might be stepping on each other's code. It notifies you if you are doing that, and if you're not doing that, it says, fine, you can check stuff in and out. Uh, uh, anyone who's tried to write a, a Word document with more than two authors knows that that's, anything beyond that is a nightmare. Uh, using uh, ASCII text and a, and a revision control and a repository is infinitely better than that, even, even for writing documents, much less for writing code. Uh, debugging tools, GCC plus GDB plus Emacs is the lowest common denominator, but it's a surprisingly effective. Uh, and it's, it's the one that we use in the course. Visualization and data analysis tools, sometime you really ought to get, I, if you haven't already, 
get get the developers of, of Visit and Paraview here, uh, um, and and have them strut their stuff. And their stuff is quite struttable. Now, what's next? What's in your future? Um, more parallelism. So I, I didn't check this slide to make sure that this thing hadn't. Let's let's go back. Okay. So here's what this graph here, which um, these two graphs kind of tell a story, and the story is why life is getting much harder. This is if we had taken the uh, Intel architecture and just clocked it faster and faster because we had smaller and smaller features. This is what it would, this is the amount of heat you'd have to dissipate as a function of time. Uh, you know, you get to about a hot plate stage and that's as far as it went because up here you're getting, this is a log scale, up here you're getting things that are like the, uh, you know, rocket nozzle or the, the temperature of the core of the sun. Yeah, it's, it's just ridiculous. So at some point, Around 2000, the uh, hardware manufacturers uh, realized uh, this, this was not going any farther than, than maybe hot plate, if that. So what they did instead, but still, they could put more and more things on a, on a, on a chip because feature size was getting smaller, technology for building these things. So what they did instead was rather than put faster processors on a chip, they put more processors on a chip. So they can put more transistors. Those have been going up linearly. Uh, however, the clocks, clock rate flattened out around early 2000s to, to around uh, a, a, a few gigahertz. Uh, what started happening around that time was you started seeing more cores. Uh, and that number of cores, those things that I had drew six little boxes for, um, projected to be, you know, 100, 1,000 over the next decade, decade and a half. Um, if you think you had problems with memory hierarchies before uh, and organizing your calculations, uh, you think you're, you've got, things aren't going to be much worse when you have that much computing power. Uh, but there's more, uh, or shall I say less. Uh, this is the amount of energy per word for memory. And the difficulty here is that uh, this, this, this is just a, a slide as a, as a reminder for me. Memory is a power hog. So the bad news is that, uh, the, well, in some sense, the good news is you're going to get infinite amount of flops and they will cost you nothing. Uh, the bad news is that the amount of memory that you're going to have per flop is going to go down by an order of magnitude. So the byte per flop. So, what are you going to do about it? Um, adaptive meshes, my, that's my solution to everything, but it's, it, this is a statement which says it is no longer going to be possible for you to use a uniform grid simply because it's easier to program. That game is over when you have a tenth of the memory. Uh, scalable matrix-free methods for sparse linear systems. You really have to, you, you cannot afford the memory to store the matrix. Uh, changing discretizations to trade bytes for flops, uh, higher order methods. Uh, there's a program called RX Solvers uh, where we are funded to investigate precisely this. One of the things we're investigating is precisely this issue, how to trade bytes per flops. Uh, more effectively exploit mathematical locality to increase data locality. Uh, that's kind of an obscure statement. I, I'll, I'll just leave that one as, a, as, as obscure because it takes too long to explain. Um, the new landscape may change model choices and trade-offs. If for, for decades people have used reduced chemistry models in combustion because it was too expensive to do the computation of a full chemistry model. Well, it turns out that chemistry is kind of like dense linear algebra on every grid point. So flops go up a lot faster than the memory. So it it may well be the case that it's, you might want to reconsider that decision because you can do a lot more flops and get actually much higher fidelity representation of the chemistry at the same time. A lot more flops per byte. Uh, 
grid resolution problem complexity is going up. I mean, we're building bigger computers. We, want, we must want to use them for something. Uh, applications users want the same throughput on finer grids. Uh, in climate, you know, the, the figure of merit is computed years per day. But the CFL condition says that the time step for explicit methods are as delta t is order delta x, where p is at least one. So that means more implicit methods, without increasing the memory footprint, uh, reformulation of the problem that effective, more effectively parallelizes across state space. Um, so if you have, again, uh, the climate example, if you're doing uh, transport of chemical species, well, you have 100 chemical species that you're interested in. Uh, you can parallelize the transport of them over species. They don't, they don't strongly couple. The advection doesn't strongly couple or the diffusion. And then aggressive use of subcycling in time, physical space, state space. To do all of these things, you have to understand a lot of the, the deep mathematics about the way the models work, about the way the models couple, about the way the numerics work. So here are the conclusions from that little set of scare slides, um, that everything is on the table over the next decade. That's good news for you. you. This gives you lots of intellectual opportunities. Uh, models, algorithms, software, maybe even the hardware. I, I, I'm co-design notwithstanding, I don't think that we have a lot of juice with the hardware manufacturers. Um, we're, we're too small a part of their market. Um, hardware, multiple levels of communication, high bandwidth, and low bandwidth, low latency. If there's one thing I could, I could beg the hardware people for, it would be this, because it would make a whole class of algorithms viable that are going to be, it, 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 it would allow me to be more global on a coarse grain scale. And that actually helps you in a lot of situations. That's enough global for you to be. Software languages, libraries that are sufficiently expressive. Now. Everything is going to change. You're going to have dynamic, time-varying loads, coupled multiple physics, multiple scales, unpredictably heterogeneous compute nodes. Uh, you know, a node drops out. Uh, there's even an example that we had a few years ago where uh, we had, there was a single bit error on one of the nodes uh, of, a super, of one of the supercomputers, and it caused a 10% degradation in the performance. It was the error correction. Error correcting memory slowed it down. And it took us several weeks to ferret that one out. Um, so anything that says I can predict how, er how everything's going to be parallel, and therefore I can just say make it parallel to here, to here, to here, bulk synchronous parallelism, no longer viable. Applications, I think that the scientific communities have made part of the transition of using professionally developed libraries. I think that the changes in architecture uh, are going to move them more in that direction. Um, here's one where we need computer scientists to help us. The increasing cost of data access tends, leads to turning modular code into monolithic code. How do we preserve your usability across applications? And this is really a compiler problem. How do we deal, tell compilers to, uh, to build interprocedural, how to do interprocedural analysis? Um, new models, algorithms, and software have long lead times for scientific impact. Um, and then this last one here is how are we going to get there? Uh, how are we going to start? MPI plus X is what everyone's doing now. But that's not what we're going to end up. We're going to end up with completely different programming models. Uh, that's what's in your future. So I'll stop here, and I think I'm stopping on time. Thank you.